Good evening to all the children of our creator. We are glad that you have gathered in this space, in this virtual place for this evening's time of sharing about the Nehemiah Project and some of the great things that God is doing in our midst. As we prepare to get started this evening, it is my responsibility as the program grant manager to open us up with the word of prayer. My name is Dr. Terrence Bridges, and I am delighted and honored to be able to serve as one of the grant managers for the Nehemiah Project. Let us now open with the word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you. We're grateful and thankful to you for this another opportunity to give glory and honor to you through the collective work that you have called us together for. Thank you for how you have woven together the tapestry of gifts, of regions, of churches, of resources, of people, of experiences, of personality, all to impact and affect our spirituality. I pray that as we are in this space tonight, that we will make effective and efficient use of this time and that we will be inspired about what has transpired thus far in regards to kingdom work, and that we will be motivated to continue to go forward, knowing that how far we have come is further than where we were. And thank you, Father, that you will be with us always through the process. Bless us now as we're in this space and place. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, friends. My name is uh, Angela Kowser. I serve as the Associate Professor of Black Church Studies, Doctor of Ministry Programs, and Associate Dean of Doctor of Ministry Programs at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. I have about eight minutes tonight uh, to talk just ever so briefly with you about the similarities and differences between African-American rural and urban churches. So I'm going to pull up a screen share right now and uh, show you what I've got. Can y'all see that? Can you shake your head or something? Just let me know you can see that. Thank you, Gerald. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Claudette. So um, what I have here is uh, a summary that Professor Taylor and I worked out last week. Uh, let me just go right to it. First of all, with COVID-19, the pandemic effects on church life for African-American urban churches, uh, <clears throat> issues around technology, especially electronic technology to, uh, to uh, aid in worship for some of these churches was, was present before COVID, but it is now uh, nearly impossible to do ministry right now without some kind of online presence and the technology to make that happen. Before uh, COVID attendance in many African-American urban churches was in person and online. Uh, in COVID, I'm not saying that we're out of COVID because we're not, we're nowhere near out of it, but in COVID, uh, in person and online. And both rural and urban churches are dealing with declines in membership in an particularly in attendance uh, for all the church, church events, especially in worship for persons who are members. What is also happening with hybrid church is that people who are members or affiliates uh, to the congregation who live outside the general area are typically coming to join the, the church in worship online. For rural churches, technology typically was not an issue before COVID, but it is now. Uh, and so just about every church, I think, in the Nehemiah Project is hybrid, that is in-person and online. But most of the churches are also dealing, again, with some declines, not all, but many churches are dealing with declines uh, in in-person attendance for all events, especially in worship. And this is a, this is a major issue uh around what it's going to look like going forward what attendance looks is going to look like going forward uh in COVID, which we will be which will be with us for a while the second issue is around depopulation in urban uh areas in urban communities the de depopulation is due in large measure to gentrification 
That is that outside and sometimes inside economic interests, corporate interests, investors, uh, want to gentrify an area in order to make money. We see this all over the place now with increases in rent, uh, rents and also uh, people who want to buy homes are being priced out of the market by uh, prices that they cannot afford or they're competing with investors who have uh, largely unlimited funds. With urban churches, we're looking at the sale of church buildings, which sometimes, which is part of gentrification, which forces some congregations then to buy property in suburban areas and relocate the congregation to those uh, areas, which can sometimes scatter people and cause dislocation and disorientation. The other thing, and what that also means is that these congregations, which were formerly walking congregations, people could walk to, to church, are now congregations where people have to drive to church. This is a serious issue for uh, rural churches as well, but the depopulation is typically not centered around gentrification, but rather to job loss and low to no economic development. And when there's no economic development, young people and others uh, leave the area in order to find work and educational opportunities. Long, and this is a long-term structural issue in uh, rural areas, and it is one that uh, I think every single one of our rural churches uh, is dealing with. And this is especially acute around uh, children, teens, and young adults uh, who exit in order to find work uh, and educational opportunities. And again, uh, again with young people, the, and this is, a, this is an issue uh, not only with black churches, but this is an issue with churches more generally. Uh, and that is young people who are generally not interested in church, even when we do hybrid worship. And uh, this is an issue that we, we talked about last week. What is it? What do we do? Why are young people not interested? And what does that mean for the future um, of our churches? Uh, so we're looking, and then the final issue, which I didn't get a chance to type here, is around leadership. And what we find in most urban communities is that the larger churches, African-American churches are uh, dominated by male leadership. We see that also in rural areas dominated by male leadership in the larger churches. But in the smaller churches, we're, we're typically, we may see uh, female leadership. And this is an issue, this is, a, this is a significant and serious issue that I think is connected in some measure to the decline because we have male leadership and female membership. And when you, when you suppress uh, the thinking and the leadership of your members uh, who just happen to fem be female and you don't have new ideas coming in around what to do around these other issues, you have issues of decline. So I'm saying COVID-19 around technology is an issue. Depopulation is an issue. Issues around young people, and this gets this issue around young people gets to the very succession of churches. What happens uh, if we cannot attract and retain young people? And then the last uh, issue that is tied to all of this is uh, gentrification. Is there anything else that you all would like to add to? I'm going to stop sharing. Anything else that you'd like to add to that? list? Or would you like to challenge anything that I said? If you could unmute yourself. And we could talk about all this also tomorrow night when we meet uh, for our second class, but any thoughts about what you've heard tonight? Tanisha, Thea, Roland, Terry. I have no thoughts. This is a good outline. No yeah, thoughts. I mean, we talked to us about some of this last week, Tanisha, you remember? Yes, Some we did. Yes, we did. Yes. Other persons. It's pretty much on point with, you know, what's going on all, all around us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And so in rural areas, it really gets, it, it really is connected to, if we want young people to stay in the area, there has to be economic development to keep them there. Correct. And educational opportunities to keep them there. And if that, and that's not there, they have to exit mm -hmm. in order to you know, make a living for themselves and their, and their families. 
It's That's definitely true. consistent with the research, um, even over the past seven years in regards to the centrality of the black church as an institution um, in both rural and urban communities and the shifting that is taking place amongst our people and amongst the faith community as it relates to the centrality of the black church as a social institution. So are you, and I know I'm, a, I'm right at time, are you suggesting Dr. Bridges that uh, part of our work needs to, to be around economic development uh, in order to help our young people stay in our communities? Uh, definitely, the, rele the relevance of, of our work has to get back to um, the practical. Um, and if not, if it's just going to be about the ideas that are transcendent to us and not immediate in terms of the needs within our context, then we will continue to see a lack of luster, at least in terms of the perception towards the black church. Thank you. That is what young people are saying now. Thank you for that addition. Anybody else, Dr. Adams, Reverend Shoemake? I just uh, was not privileged to the conversation that you all had last week, uh, but my thought or concern centered around the uh, male versus female leadership in the church. Uh, are you all saying that because it's male dominant in some areas that it causes decline? What I'm this that nobody I'm I'm making that I'm I'm making the claim that when uh, there is discrimination against a group of people because of their race or their gender, in this case with women, and that in this case female voices are suppressed. What we're doing is we're suppressing and we're only letting male voices speak. We're suppressing a lot of leadership and a lot of new ideas around ways in which the church can grow and develop. And I'm not saying that churches in Nehemiah are doing this. This is a, this is a broader okay. uh, reading of black churches more generally speaking. And a lot of white churches is too, it's not just black churches. But that if we need our best leaders, our best thinking wherever they come from and whomever has it and uh, whosoever will cometh. And if we are in a, in a situation where we are suppressing the, the thought of our people because of their gender, the leadership capabilities of our people because of gender, uh, it's a problem. Because we're not getting all of our best thinking. We're getting only some of our best thinking. Please come back at me, Reverend Shoemaker. Oh, no, I'm I'm good. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> right. So so and and this is and so we're I'm, we're really just saying that we 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 really need to rethink leadership and to be more inclusive of females and other persons who have ideas about ways in which our church can grow and thrive because the future of it, of our church, our beloved church is at stake. That's what's at stake in this question. That's what's at stake in this question. Let me stop talking so that other people can, can speak. We'll talk more about that tomorrow night. Thank you. And after you give that explanation, I, it's clear for me, the thought process, um, and it's not just a, um, an indictment against male leadership. Not at all. It's an indictment against the church in general. It's an indictment around a theology that suppresses half the population. Okay. Uh, and expects an institution to be healthy. Um, so we need our best thinkers and we need to let the spirit move and be free and to blow where 
it will so that our best thinkers and leaders can emerge and, and, and let us come together to deliberate about the future of what gives us life. And that needs to be, I think, Reverend, Reverend Shoemake, whosoever will cometh, and that includes young people. That may also include teens uh, who have a different perspective because they're younger on what's happening with young people, the pressures on them that could enrich our ministries in such ways that perhaps our young people would come back. Does that make sense to you? Makes sense to me. Yeah. And it, and it, would, it would also perhaps include men, for example, Black men who are not in churches right now. In other words, the, the conversation about the future of the Black church needs to expand beyond the Black church to, to if, if we want our church to grow and thrive. That's, that's, the, that's the claim. We'll work on it some more. Thank you so much. I have a question. Can you all hear me? We need to gotta move on. Can you hold your question till later on, Dr. Adams? Sure. Sure. All right. All right. We need to spotlight myself and Reverend Snorton. Hello, I am Claudette Snorton, and I am a co-director of the Nehemiah Project. At its inception, the Nehemiah Project's goal is and was to support primarily rural historic. Black churches to work together shoulder to shoulder to devise specific strategies for defining spiritual values, connecting with surrounding communities, and responding to congregational challenges. The COVID-19 pandemic illustrated the profound problems that some churches were and still are having. The Nehemiah Project seeks to promote opportunities for the 15 rural and urban congregations to maneuver through the challenging conditions that impede congregations and to help its member congregations to move from merely being surviving congregations to becoming thriving congregations. Thriving congregations are distinguished by the following guidelines. Strong, vital, contextual, scripture-driven teaching, preaching, outreach, missions, training, and evaluations. Deeply interconnected and trusting relationships. Three, clear, congregational values to guide ministry and develop leaders. Four, consistent participation in all areas of congregational life. And five, powerful engagement in community life. In our first year, using these five characteristics, the Nehemiah Project used a variety of workshops, learning opportunities, Bible studies to assist us into becoming thriving congregations. Our co-director, Reverend Dr. Amariah McIntosh will explain more. Yes, uh, we began by doing a survey of the clergy and a survey of the laity. We also did a technology survey asking our pastors about their personal technology experience as well as what was available at their local churches. Recognizing that during COVID, when our church doors were closed, that most of us were somehow trying to get into the virtual environment. From the technology survey, uh, we were able to contract with uh, Mr. Ken Stone up in North, Northwestern Indiana, 
who purchased for all of our churches uh, laptop computers that he personally delivered, installed, and set up so that churches could be able to uh, use those resources along with their uh, high-speed internet that they received from the seminary's grant to uh, be able to better live stream their worship services. We also, with the help of Dr. Diane Reistroffer, were able to secure experts in the fields of finances, insurance, and health who guided our clergy in ways to improve their financial, their mental, and their physical health. We concluded the year with a Bible series taught by the seminary's own Dr. Justin Reed. That uh, kind of sums up what we accomplished in year one, and then we moved on. We are now currently in year two. Dr. Bridges, if you would come and introduce our presenters. Dr. Bridges? Oh. He says he is frozen. We are about to present to you the regions of the Nehemiah Project who will share with you their work, their hopes going forward, and what the project means to them. In order, they will be the Louisville region, the Toledo region, the Bardstown region, and Hopkinsville, which will be divided into two regions. The Louisville region is up first. Uh, please pray for Dr. Marion Miller, who was to be the presenter uh, she took ill today, but she did submit a video. And so we're asked if our hosts would uh, share the screen and run the video on the Louisville region. My name is Dr. Marion Miller, the regional director for the Louisville area. It consists of three churches which we would like to share their history, some high moments, and some hopes for the project. They will be presented in the order that you see on the screen. Lampkins Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, our history from 1896 to present. The cornerstone from the original church that was built on Wabasso Avenue states that Lampkins Chapel was organized as a church in 1896. The second building was located at 417 East Woodlawn Avenue. In 1991, Lampkins Chapel was relocated to its current location on 2738 Algonquin Parkway due to the planned expansion of the Louisville Muhammad Ali International Airport. In July 2019, Reverend Claudette Snorton was assigned as the pastor of Lampkins Chapel CME Church. On February 20th, 2022, Lampkins Chapel celebrated its 126th church anniversary. During those 126 years of service, Lampkins Chapel has earned the reputation as a church that is family oriented and dedicated to the nurturing of children. Lampkins Chapel has a variety of outreach ministries, which include a very active Girl Scout troop called GWOG, our Girls Without Worries, a box full of blessings, the 10 ministry, 
participation in the angel tree for Christmas and God's Angels of Praise and Rated PG liturgical dance teams. Each of these ministries are designed to provide teaching and learning opportunities for the children, youth, and young adults of Lampkins, as well as providing community outreach. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Lampkins was forced to close its doors in 2020. However, that did not stop Lampkins from weekly worship. We utilize Zoom and Facebook Live to live stream our worship services. Lampkins Chapel has been able to expand its live streaming services to include not only streaming Sunday morning serv worship service, but to include streaming weekly Bible study meetings and more utilizing the expertise of the Nehemiah Project. Lampkins Chapel is in the process of making long-range goals for future community organizing and development. Taylor Town Amy Zion Church is 154 years old. It was established in the midst of a majority white community. The church was developed on donated land that African American community could have a place to worship. In these 154 years, Taylor Town has had two physical buildings. The current church was built in 1958 futuristic in design in 1958, but too small for that congregation even at that time. The church had a desire to grow and design this building for future development. Over the years, the church has acquired property on the north and south sides of the church. The church membership still has a desire to expand the physical plant as a sign of community to the community that we are a growing church. Prior to COVID, we as a congregation have been in serious discussion about developing our adjacent properties. We classify ourselves as a multiracial congregation because we do have one white member and several visitors uh, came and visited with us prior to COVID. Our church is rooted in the Worthington community. At one point in our history, all our members live within 10 mile, within a 10 mile radius. Currently, our closest members live within three miles and the others as far as 30 miles away. And those who have the longest travel are very committed to this congregation. Highlights of the church, we received donated land over a half an acre to the uh, south of us. We participated in a land usage swap uh, and acquired another piece of property that we developed in uh, to a needed parking lot. Um, another, we combined a mortgage on the church parsonage and a loan to develop the parking lot in the amount of $140,000 uh, and paid off that 15 year note in seven years. These were great accomplishments for this small congregation. I tell you, it's been very rewarding to participate in Zion ministry. With the help of God, we have helped to lead this congregation for the last 18 years. The people have grown spiritually and their faith has been strengthened. We have been able to make connections throughout this community over the years, and we look forward to developing new relationships with other churches. I'm looking forward to serving this congregation for years to come. Thank you. In 1867, Three slave families migrated from Kentucky and settled in Jeffersonville of Southern Indiana. Their faithful prayer services were held in their homes. A revival the next year grew their numbers and moved them 
to search for a building. With God's provision, the congregation became owners of their building and land, a donation from a staunch anti-slavery politician, Dr. Nathaniel Phil. The congregation celebrates this year 155 years. As the current senior pastor of Wesley United Methodist Church here in Jeffersonville, I discovered over 25 years ago that the church was energized with a strong focus on mission outside of the church and the vibrant discipleship inside of the church. The congregation was leading the Jeffersonville community with several landmark roles, such as the first black fire chief and the first black police chief. The congregation also contributed city politicians, local leaders of the NAACP, as well as principals and teachers for the various schools. Approximately six years ago, the church was on the cusp of merging or closing. The late Bishop Michael Carner asked me to take one more assignment. As the leadership looked into the future, we noticed the way Wesley throughout history had focused on the inward and outward ministries of the church in equal measure. Together, we embarked upon a strategy in 2017 to develop its vision, mission, and key directives. Then we got to work. As we sought to live into God's vision, which is to become a spiritually formed community of Christians, seeking to win souls and make disciples for Christ, the congregation was mindful of the need for spiritual formation of all ages. One of the ways we lived into our vision was a project called Mission Possible Kids. It was designed to equip and empower children to do ministry grades one through five. Outside of the walls of the church, God opened the doors for Wesley to meet a felt need in the community. They did not have the capability to access affordable groceries. So in 2017, Fresh Stop Market, a farmer's market with reduced prices for low-income shoppers, opened in the parking lot of Wesley. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Wesley United Methodist Church also began the premier service, a digital service, pre-recorded worship that is shared through Facebook, YouTube, and a local TV network. We thank God for the ability to partnership with the Nehemiah Project. As we surely move forward, God has written the past and God is leading us into the future for more remarkable ministry. Dr. McIntosh and to the others who are gathered here today. I'm Eric Shoemaker and I was asked if I could give some highlights of um, what the program has meant to us here at the Taylortown Church, what we've learned uh, through uh, this program, some expectations going forward. And I tell you, we've had um, a wealth of knowledge that has been presented to us uh, in seminaries, in seminars, excuse me, uh, with personal health and personal finance and insurance um, um, presentations. Uh, all of these things have helped uh, to uh, develop our own personal well beings. Um, we're looking forward to uh, the bigger things to come. Uh, more community uh, involvement and 
uh, making connections with um, other communities through the project uh, Nehemiah and, and expanding properties and uh, our ministry uh, wherever possible. Uh, we think that the uh, program has been beneficial in many ways. Uh, and, and though I, I believe there are some things that are um, that I that have happened or taken place that causes us on uh, in, at least in my uh, uh, community to be a little bit um, taken aback. Uh, but we're looking forward to working toward uh, our having a cohesive uh, working relationship moving forward with the Nehemiah project. That all the things that um, uh, has been promised we can benefit from, and we can also. Um, benefit the community uh, by the work of the Nehemiah Project through the Taylor Town Church. Thank you all for allowing us to be a part. Thank you, Louisville Region. All right, Cassie. I like me now. There we go. And as you travel from Louisville up I-71 at Cincinnati, you switch over to I-75 and come up into Northwestern Ohio. From there, you will see that the two churches from Ohio that are part of the Nehemiah Project, the two churches are the Faith Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church located in Fostoria, Ohio. And then right at the Ohio Michigan State Line is the Phillips Temple CME Church or Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. We wanted to recognize our Episcopal leadership. The AME Bishop is Bishop Aaronis E. McLeod. The CME Bishop is Bishop Marvin Frank Thomas Sr. The current pastors are Reverend Dr. Amaria McIntosh at Phillips Temple and Reverend Dr. Lacrita Clark, who is serving as presiding elder and pastor of the Faith Chapel Church. Please keep her in your prayers. She was rushed to the hospital today and unfortunately will not be able to share with us this evening. So please keep her in your prayers. Faith Chapel was founded in 1952. This year means they will be celebrating 70 years. Faith Chapel AME Church is one of three black churches in Fostoria and is the only black Methodist church in the area. They moved to their current location, 220 Sycamore Street in 1954. The city of Fostoria is located 40 miles south of Toledo. There are 13,046 residents of which 4.8% are black. Fostoria, Ohio is known for its railroads. They say that over a hundred trains stop through that, pass through that city every day. It was also one of the larger glass factories in the state of Ohio. Listed is a picture of Reverend Willie B. James, the founding pastor. Phillips Temple in Toledo, Ohio, you see a picture of Reverend Melvin Hunt Sr., the church founder. The church was founded in 1916 in Rossford, Ohio, and relocated to Toledo the following year. It is one of six Black Methodist churches in Toledo. Our previous location on Lawrence Avenue in Toledo was destroyed totally by fire in 1971. The church is now in its current location and has been since 1975. Toledo, as it's shown, is the fourth largest city in the state of Ohio. 27.4% of its residents are Black. 25% of residents 
of all races live at or below the poverty line. Toledo is home to the Chrysler Jeep plant, the GM powertrain plant, and Corning Glass, and it is also home to the University of Toledo. Some photos of Faith Chapel over the years, their youth and adults. And here you see a picture of the inside of the Faith Chapel Church in this photograph. Here we have some pictures of Phillips Temple, CME Church, its members. Uh, the picture on the left is the was the ministerial staff. A couple of them have retired. Uh, this was on the right, our hat day that we held during Black History Month prior to the church shutting down due to the pandemic. Here are some other photos of members and of our youth ministry. Since the pandemic, our church has been uh, having virtual worship services on Zoom as well as Facebook Live. Uh, our Facebook audience uh, sometimes exceeds the church membership. Since the first Sunday of April, we have resumed total in-person worship and are in the process of beginning uh, allowing our NA and AA ministries to resume the building. We were visited by our project consultant, Dr. Gerald Taylor, in uh, January of this year, who is working with all of the congregations in trying to re-envision and reimagining their worship spaces. Here are some photographs of the inside of the sanctuary. It is our hope and our prayer that with this project, that it will help us to become the thriving congregation and leader in the Toledo area that this church has been for the last 106 years. It is also the prayers of the Faith Chapel Church that they too will be able to benefit from their help with the project and their work with the participation of Drs. Kauser and Taylor. And in conclusion, we just want to share with you a song from our youth choir. It's going to be and will be a lovely day. And now we take you back into Kentucky to the Bardstown region, Reverend Roscoe P. Linton. Roscoe P. Linton, this is Roscoe M. Linton. I would, we praise God on today for allowing you to be with us. I'm the Reverend Roscoe M. Linton, the director of the Bardstown region of the Nehemiah Project. And within this project, within this project, we have four churches. One is located in Bartstown, Kentucky. The other is in Springfield, Kentucky, Lebanon, Kentucky, 
and Bloomfield, Kentucky. We are thankful that we're able to come to this point in time at this meeting for the Nehemiah Project. And the churches have been blessed through the Nehemiah Project because when we were in pandemic, many of the churches were struggling, but because of the internet service, the laptops that were provided, we were still able to do ministry. Let us look at the St. John Methodist, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church history. The exterior of that building and the church structure remains largely to the, as the same as it was years ago. It was founded by the persons of the Barchtown community. And St. John Amy Zion Church has been a visible community of faith from the beginning. Many lives have been encouraged in various ways and the community of Cape Faith has nurtured and produced some great minds and leaders. One notable member was Bishop Alexander Walters, born in August of 1858, here in one of the local restaurants. Bishop Walters was a founder of the NWACP and St. John was very proud of his accomplishments. The Reverend Roscoe Linton, I was assigned as pastor of St. John and I entered ministry here. And then 30 years later or 40 years later, I was assigned to this great congregation. My wife stands beside me here at St. John and we're just thankful for her as well as the ministry of this great church. The Johnson Chapel in Zion Church is in Springfield, Kentucky. It was founded October 18th, 1872 by a group of slaves on 3rd, 300 East High Street in Springfield, Kentucky. The lot was purchased from O.L. Bosley for $140 before the Civil War. And the church was by, by Wills McElroy, the first pastor, the Reverend T.P. Johnson, the current pastor is the Reverend Roland Pierre. Reverend Roland Pierre has done much at the church. During this pandemic, they have paid off their mortgage and they will be having a mortgage burning very soon. So we praise God for that congregation. The Sherman Chapel Amy Zion Church is located in Lebanon, Kentucky. In 1873, shortly after being liberated from bondage of slavery, five Christian men purchased a plot of land from the Isaac and Emily Mills for the purpose of providing a place of divine worship. These five men, Simon Irvin, Greensmith, Matthew Taylor, Henry Mack, and William Reed were the first trustees of Sherman Chapel Amy Zion Church under the spiritual guidance of Bishop Singletary, Thomas Jones, the Reverend S. Sherman founded the Sherman Chapel Church. The original building and all of the church records were destroyed by fire on April 7th, 1912. From 1912 to 1914, services were conducted at the Colored School located on East Water Street. This building still stands and was purchased by Tim Childers in December of 1995. The present church was erected in 1914 on the same site of G.E.W. Clements and was officiating at that time as the Felix Anderson Annex and was begun in 1972 under the pastor of the Reverend George E. Mahan and supported by presiding elder M.C. Jones and Bishop Hogarth. Trustees at that time were Ann Simpson, J.D. Bell, Mary Lou Van Cleve, Minnie Black, and Ella Porter. The pastor is the Reverend Tanisha Durrett Simpson and who serves with her as her husband, Charles Simpson, the first gentleman. The other church on our, in the Bargetown region is the Campbell Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Campbell Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church claimed this establishment in 1875. His name first appeared in 1876 in the General Conference held at the 15th Street 
now Hewlett Temple AME Zion Church in Louisville, Kentucky. In the 100 years of Zion Methodism, written by James W. Hood, DD, the Reverend Smith Claiborne pastored in the early years in the Kentucky Conference serving the Bloomfield Circuit of Nelson County. Presiding Elder H. Campbell also served the Kentucky Conference during the years of 1876, 1879, and the church could have been named for him. Reverend Linton? Yes. I don't think our, our video is being played. I was trying to share my screen. So you can keep yes. going, but we have a PowerPoint presentation. However, as Bishop Wall's book, Reality of the Black Church, Campbell Chapel may have been organized by Reverend E.H. Carey, a native Kentuckian who built several churches in Kentucky, St. John and Spratley Memorial, or the Reverend Bunch who contributed greatly to Zion's growth. Both did extensive work in Kentucky Conference, both before and after the Kentucky Conference was officially organized in 1866. At one time there was a church circuit of Walker's Chapel AME Zion Church in Maud, Kentucky, which burned down beginning in 1939. The Campbell Chapel AME Zion Church was served independently of other AME Zion churches in, re in the surrounding counties and presiding elder at that time. The pastor of the Campbell Chapel is the Reverend Harriet McAvaney, and she's doing an excellent job there. During the pandemic, she has made various structure changes and purchased new pews, and also placed a parking lot within that church property. Our Nehemiah Project Review. What are some of the struggles? Getting the members to commit to change, elderly needing help with social media access, need suggestions on how to effectively reach youth and young adults. How has the Nehemiah Project helped the church? Giving all the churches laptops, able to set up social media platforms, Zoom and Facebook Live internet account. What should you like to see in the future from the program? Assessment of our building space for more interaction with community, send literature to church and teens, someone to call when we need help and answers. What do I think about the program? It's a much needed program, a lot of information at one time and need a time to, to allow it to be processed. Reverend Dorette, if you could go on to the music. Thank you for listening and being a part of this program.
A man is going to get better because God is in control. Turn it over back to Dr. McIntosh. Thank you. Pastor Linton. And now over to Western Kentucky and Indiana, Reverend Batavi Combs. Dr. McIntosh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, God be praised. We thank you for the privilege to share. Uh, we're calling our first year experience, Hawkinsville Region A, Reverend Tammy Akery is our regional director. Uh, she pastors the Mount Zion CME Church in Guthrie, Kentucky. That church celebrates 138 years in Christian ministry. Reverend Acre expresses to this body that they are very excited to participate in the Nehemiah Project with the hard times hitting her area as well as most of rural Western Kentucky, people are vacating uh, the small towns in which our churches have edifices and they're going to larger cities to never return. And this has caused a decline in membership uh, in the Guthrie area, as well as the Greenville area that we'll talk about, as well as the Morganfield area and the Sturgis community. Um, the Guthrie church has been praying for the congregation to grow, but they're also uh, recognizing that in times like these, they need help. To be active in the community in which they live is very important to the people. Uh, and the Nehemiah project is given assistance in that way. The first year of the project has helped uh, this church to realize that they're not alone in trying to meet the needs of the community. With the leadership of the project, uh, the church has come to realize that there are different ways to do ministries and different ways to reach people when the church is shut down, especially due to, go, due to COVID. Uh, the church feels that they're on the right track with the technology, sewing, uh, slowly being introduced to the congregation, and they look forward to having more young people come to the church and showing off their talents by the use of modern technology. Uh, Reverend Acre has expressed a thanks and an appreciation for the different workshops and the information that's been attached to those workshops. And the church hopes for the future uh, that the church will be edified, building up the community to be used uh, by the building of intergenerational buildings, a place where people of all generations can feel safe and engage one with another. And so these are some highlights. Uh, I pray you can see my screen for the, for Reverend Acre and the community of faith in Guthrie. Uh, she's pictured here with her husband, uh, brother Bobby. And so she is our regional director and we thank you. Um, my name is Batavi Combs and I pastor the historic Wesley Chapel AME Zion Church in Greenville, Kentucky, uh, celebrating 151 years in Christian ministry. Um, we joined the Nehemiah Project shortly after the exit of the Crescent Hill Church, uh, but we were immediately blessed by the invite. Let me thank uh, the Reverend Amariah McIntosh uh, for accepting the recommendation of Reverend Roscoe Linton, uh, who suggested that the Wesley family be inducted into this program. Um, it's been a blessing to us. I was privileged to attend the new members orientation. Uh, I read the executive summary and I was impressed with what God can do with this program. 
Uh, I was privileged to meet Ken Stone, who came to Elizabethtown. We shared dinner with he and his wife, and he gave us the computer that we use for the church uh, and showed us some things that would be helpful, gave us some contact information, uh, should any problem arise with the computer and the softwares. I want to uh, praise God for the training and the workshops that the Nehemiah Project uh, gave to us. I was privileged to attend a lot of them. Uh, I want to say all of them, but all of them when we were invited in. Um, I was especially moved by the house meeting proposal taught by Dr. Taylor. And although every presentation was helpful and beneficial to pastoring in the rural area, as a Methodist, uh, the house meeting proposal was more like the Methodist class leader system. And so I praise God for all of the teachings. And speaking of uh, connecting and roots, we want to say, especially from Wesley Chapel, what a blessing Dr. Taylor was in his visit. Uh, we have written here that he put a a human face and a passionate spirit and a loving spirit with this project that people may or may not have understood. He brought life to Muhlenberg County in his visits. We are better because he came our way. He also committed to help uh, look into some things that we are struggling with structurally. And he and Reverend Linton are doing a phenomenal job. He has kept their word to do that, and we praise God for them. Uh, without Louisville Presbyterian Seminary, the Nehemiah Project would be lost, and so we say thank you. Uh, the timely stipends that um, have come have come in a timely period where we plan to update our facility with monitors and the necessary equipment that we might keep our promise and serve the community in excellence. And so that is Wesley Chapel. These are some pictures associated uh, our seal and identity. Uh, it says Wesley Chapel, uh, a community of faith serving God and God's people in excellence. Our Bishop, Bishop Michael Frencher and our supervisor. I couldn't find one person in the church that wanted to be on camera. So I put a picture of all of them together and so we're in the city of Greenville, and we thank you uh, for the privilege to serve. Next, uh, the Bowman Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, Morganfield, Kentucky, under the leadership uh, of the Reverend Jeffrey D. Sewell in 144 years of Christian ministry. And Reverend Sewell reports um, that it has taught him about ministry during the COVID season and how to do ministry on another level. Um, he spoke of how this project helped him to energize his, minister, his members who got caught up in being at home and getting comfortable at home. Um, he also noted the people as well as the pastor were very moved by Director Taylor's visits, that he was very personable and represented the seminary with excellence, and he wanted to thank the Nehemiah leadership team, his wife, Reverend Thea Sewell, who is the pastor of the Phillips Chapel Church. We're going to uh, present her in just a moment um, because he and Reverend Sewell and their churches share in this endeavor together. So thank you, Reverend Sewell, for what you have to offer. And then Reverend Thea Louise Sewell, is the pastor of the Phillips Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church in Sturgis, Kentucky, celebrating more than 150 years in Christian ministry. Um, she reports that the project is what the community needed uh, to get the church involved in the community. Um, and she believes that the Nehemiah Project will bind the church and the community together. Uh, she is very impressed by the seminars that have been presented, and she's thankful for her church to be a part of it. And this report is respectfully submitted by the authority of Reverend Tamri Akery, our regional director, 
Hopkinsville Region A, thank you and glory to God. Thank you, Reverend Combs. Our last church or our last group of churches is our other Hopkinsville region down in the area of Hopkinsville, Kentucky itself. Their uh, regional director, well, co-director, uh, Reverend Claudette Snorton will come now to introduce these congregations. Well, good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about the two churches that comprise the Hopkinsville Region B. And you can see me. Can you mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, Lane Tabernacle Christian Methodist Episcopal Church and Freeman Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Both of these churches are centered in the heart of the African American community of Hopkinsville, Kentucky. In fact, Lane and Freeman are only a few blocks from each other. We'll begin with the information about Lane Tabernacle. Established in 1892, Lane Tabernacle has a long, proud heritage in the CME Church, as well as in the Hopkinsville community. Named after the fifth Episcopal, fifth bishop, and the CME Church, Bishop Isaac Lane. Lane is currently in the process of planning their 130th church anniversary Founders Day. Lane Tabernacle has had a long line of talented preachers and teachers. However, only Lane can boast of being the home of the first and only female bishop in the CME Church, Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton, who began her journey into Christendom and to the highest office in the CME Church at Lane Tabernacle. Now let's listen as Lane Tabernacle's pastor, Reverend Dr. Darwin Adams, tells us of the impact of the, of the Nehemiah Project on Lane Tabernacle. The Nehemiah Project of the Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary has allowed and inspired the Lane Tabernacle CME Church of Hopkinsville, Kentucky to have a more effective ministry um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. While we're not where we want to be, we are certainly not where uh, we used to be. I can proudly say that from March 2020 to May 22, the Lane Tabernacle Church has been worshiping in person for 109 out of a total 111 weeks. With the Nehemiah Project in ministry mind, late last year, the church agreed to get Wi-Fi um, in the sanctuary and move the television into the same space. Ministry informationals have been mailed out to the members. We've attempted to strategically take uh, the church ministry to the people's space and place of employment, and with the great excitement of being in conversation with Dr. Gerald Taylor, the church is making plans to give community development attention to the old Attics High School building, which is located across the street from the church. Amongst other psychological and spiritual assurances that come from knowing that our church has been blessed by being a part of this ministry development program while interacting with other churches who may be in the same ministry hole. The best thing I can say is that we have been inspired um, to figure out alternative ways to reach the unchurched or those who are not quite ready to come back into the sanctuary for in-person worship. Just to know that we have some funds available to do real ministry is an encouraging thing, to say the very least. Also allowing the church to identify five great leaders, Minister Marsha Watkins, Brother Malcolm Woodard, Shanita Garland, Gina Cooper, and Tony Mason, to learn more about what it means to be excellent lay leaders. Moving forward, it is my hope and my prayer that the Lane Tabernacle Church 
take seriously what it means to be faithful givers and good stewards in light of what it means to be members of the CME Church. Thank you, Louisville Seminary. Thank you, Nehemiah Project. Again, it is my hope and my prayer that the project gets four more years of funding for the contributions that you all have made to our church, uh, to our district, to our denomination, and hopefully for future reference to the city of Hopkinsville in terms of our a feeble attempt to transform um, the local community and build up the local neighborhoods. We are eternally grateful for the, the, the various ways and facets and, 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 and spheres in which you have allowed us to do effective ministry during this very, very uncertain time. We want the project here. We want the project in our church. And, and, and we have been blessed as a result of, of your generosity there at the Great Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. I can name other ways. I can name other programs. I can name other ministries. I can name other ways in which you all have blessed us. I don't have the time. I just want you to know that you want to continue this relationship well into the future. May God bless you. May God keep you all. Certainly is my prayer. The second church in the Hopkinsville Region B is Freeman Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. The history of Freeman Chapel dates back to August 1866. That's three years before the inception of the CME Church. Named after Peter Freeman, one of the church's founding fathers, Freeman Chapel has had some of the most outstanding ministers and laypersons in our denomination. Their current pastor is Reverend Lisa Lewis Balboa, and she is the first female pastor at Freeman Chapel. Now we will listen to Reverend Balboa as she tells us about Nehemiah, the Nehemiah Project's impact on Freeman Chapel. Hello, I'm Pastor Lisa Balboa, the pastor at Freeman Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, and we're located in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. I, along with the congregation, are very grateful and proud to be a part of the Nehemiah Project. During this pandemic, the Nehemiah Project has truly been a blessing to us. Because of our participation in the project, we have been able to purchase 
the necessary computer technology equipment that is needed to provide our services, both Facebook Live and via Zoom. The Nehemiah Project has challenged us to truly be the light outside of the walls. We are beginning to offer not only ministries and information sessions to our congregation, but to our community as well. We have provided COVID-19 testing and educational workshops. We have been able to provide computer training not only to the congregation, but to the community as well. Members of the community have shared how grateful they are to be a part of these sessions. Our lay team had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Taylor. And because of the visit with Dr. Taylor, our lay team, which includes Reverend Melton Brooks, Sister Bernie's Tribune, and Sister Patricia Rogers have begun to talk to members of the congregation about the importance of having ministries for children, youth, and young adults. Again, we are happy and proud to be a part of the Nehemiah Project, and we are looking forward to what our church will become because of our participation in this project. Thank you. For the opportunity. God bless. As you can see, the Nehemiah Project is making a profound difference in the lives of the Hopkinsville Region B churches, and they say thank you. Thank you, Reverend Storton, and to all of our pastors of this project. Before we bring Dr. Taylor, uh, we're going to ask if Reverend Tanisha Durrett Simpson would come. And host, if you could please give her screen sharing capability so that we can see the fabulous churches in the Bardstown region. You able to share now? Okay. Reverend McIntosh, would you like for me to share it? And okay, then, if you um, have it, yeah, please share yes, it. Please. Okay, yes. I will share okay, it. One thank moment. You. And after the slideshow, Dr. Taylor. You can come on.
Good evening to everyone, and thank you to all those who are participating in this gathering this evening, and to the pastors and lay people of the churches that I've had the privilege to visit and spend time with uh, in your churches. Uh, it was indeed an honor and continues to be one to share in this journey. In the book of Nehemiah, in the second chapter, we see the beginnings of the inspection of Jerusalem, the walls down in various parts of the city, Nehemiah making notes, figuring out what needs to be done. And then the third chapter, he calls the people together. And in the wonderful 17th verse, he says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we no longer may suffer disgrace. I told them that the hand of their God had been gracious upon me and also the words that the king had spoken to me. Then they said, let us start building. So they committed themselves to the common good. And that represents the Nehemiah project in the moment we're in today. We are meeting and, and wrestling with the walls that, represent, that are represented by our church facilities and properties and assets of the church and deciding and thinking and wrestling with how they are to be redesigned and rebuilt and reorganized to address the future that we are facing as a black community in most of these cities and towns. The book of Nehemiah is, is more than just about rebuilding a wall, though. It's about rebuilding a people, reconnecting them to their history and their stories and re-understanding their journey and mission and regathering the scattered tribes and bringing them back home. And the Nehemiah Project in this second year, we are preparing, hopefully, to gather all the churches for that rebuilding process and, re and rethinking uh, the physical plants. It means going out and speaking to neighbors and doing the kind of audit of the community that's gonna be required to think through ministries going forward. So every church is being asked to talk to their own members, to talk to lapsed members, to talk to family members in different parts of the country, to talk to their neighbors, the small business people, to principals and teachers and students and folk in government to get a feel for what they would like to see these wonderful churches do going forward, to, to in their re-representing of themselves going forward. And to look at what that vision can look like by incorporating and bringing into partnership the University of Kentucky School of Architecture, we hope to also bring in the Western Kentucky University School of Architecture to participate in envisioning the redesign of these church facilities and properties this year. But there's another part of this, which is the outreach to a community of young adults and young people that have become disillusioned with the idea of church and even disillusioned with the idea of faith that they struggle theologically with their lived experience versus what they've been told the word says. They struggle with not seeing in facilities and programs things that speak to their struggle, their hopes, their aspirations going forward. This is across young people, no matter their race, where they live, or what communities they are. They are, we are in a struggle for the reconnection of this generation to the idea of the cross and the reclamation of sin. So that's this year we seek to build about the beginnings of this organizing effort in each church. And hopefully within the next few months, each church will have a preliminary story and framework of where they see their ministry going forward and ideas for what they'd like to see in a redesign of their facilities and the use of assets and space. It also means more 
conversations and workshops on the use of technology and the making that technology universally available to their membership to feel comfortable in the development of their hybrid church ministries going forward. And hopefully the project will be able to provide the resources and active on-time support that's necessary for that journey. In 2023, assuming that we finish and have designs that are visually seen for each church that people can uh, revel in that, that those designs and those ideas, then in 2023, we seek to make them real, a reality through the raising of the kind of resources and money that are gonna be necessary to do the projects as thought through. And also training and developing our people's capacity to extend itself into the larger community to call people back home to a revisioning and a rethinking of church and where it's going. So that is where we look to be. That is where we look to go. And with the help of those that are in this room together and with the mighty voice and hand of God, that we will be able to translate the Nehemiah project in 2023 into something that can be a leaven in the midst of all of our denominations going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, if we could put us into gallery view, we're going to ask our audience if they have any questions for any of us. And if you have any questions, if you would please type them into the chat and I will be monitoring the chat and directing the questions to the participants. Well, maybe some of the participants may have questions to ask of somebody else. Dr. Adams, you had one before we had to go into our presentations. Do you still have your question? Would be a theologian if I didn't have a question for this <laughs> particular purpose. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for a wonderful gala award-winning night of presentations and glistening uh, interpretations of, of this excellent, excellent program. Um, I want to call Dr. Terrence Bridges back up to the microphone for just a minute, if at all possible. Um, he mentioned some important language um, in a prior statement. I heard him use the words, and I quote him, economic development is an important way forward. And he also used the adjective practical. And, uh, and that brought to my mind, you know, because I am a stickler, very attracted to churches and, 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 and denominations whom are committed to doing holistic ministry, whether you spell holistic with an H or a WH, it doesn't matter to me. Holistic ministry for me is the way forward. So I want Dr. Bridges to kind of give us some type of expanded statement by which he meant in, in, in gradual terms of economic development, practical, and his take on what it means to do holistic ministry from both the programmatic and a local church perspective. Dr. Terrence Bridges. He was having some technical difficulties. Uh, Anybody want Terrence, are you there? Dr. Kowser. Dr. McIntosh, anybody want to take a stab at that? Dr. Taylor? Uh, I'm sorry, Terrence is not here. Uh, what? Wait a minute, can he looks like he just, yeah, can we can hear you now. Good, good, all right, let's have Can you hear me? Hey. Hey. Yes. We can hear you, Terrence. I apologize. Technology is beautiful when it works. It is. Did you hear his question? 
I couldn't hear the last part. Oh, I, I just want to hear more about this notion of economic development, the adjective, the word you use, practical, that's practical ministry, practical theology at the local church level. And, and, and I'd like to know what does that mean in terms of, of, of the holistic commitment to doing ministry, holism, holism, not just in one sphere, but, but in a magnitude of fears, trying to reach as many people in as many ways as possible. From the perspective of the scripture first, and then I'll take it to research. I mean, we have Luke 2.52, where Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, in favor with God and man. And so there was this idea of his cognitive development. There was this idea of his social development, his physical development, along with his spiritual development. And so for any ministry that is to approach that, um, it's important that we consider all of those aspects and all of those ways in developing man. And so with the Nehemiah Project and some of the work that Dr. Gerald Taylor is doing in terms of engaging the community, that is in favor with man. Um, some of the work that we have done over the course of the past year with the presenters, with the pastors, in terms of their physical care and physical well being, is growing in, in stature. Um, and then in wisdom, in favor with God, we also have the Nehemiah Bible study series as a part of that. You know, th those are just prototypes, I guess, or that is a prototype of what is offered uh, and can be offered through the local congregation in terms of being holistic in our approach and yep. not just coming together and singing a hymn and hearing a message. Um, what Lincoln, uh, there are a couple of researchers by the name of Lincoln Chatters, Lincoln Chatters and a few others who talk about the semi-involuntary institution I don't know if you all have heard that, but particularly in the South, how Blacks, um, the only way that they gained social status at one point was through the institution, the Black church, um, because there was no other area in society prior to integration where they could advance socially. And so many became involved with the Black church because of that and many stayed involved with the black church, even through the civil rights movement and era, and then the industrial migration, because the black church was addressing social issues of the day and unifying around social issues of the day. Whereas now around issues of LGBTQA, around issues of uh, black lives matter and things and community development, we see less of a presence of the voice of the black church in those areas. And because of that, this generation has turned away and saw other things and other social services for their relevance rather than the black church. Hopefully that makes sense when I say it. No, that's good. That's good. That's good, Doc. That's good. Very quickly, I just want to say one of, one of, one of the things that makes this program so great is um, its attention to detail, not just spiritual and religious, denominational, so on and so forth, is that social, political, economic, um, the spiritual, the sociological, the psychological, the programmatic, so on and so forth. You know, I applaud, I applaud again, Dr. Kowser, Dr. Taylor, I applaud the efforts of the program to, to, to inspire and teach and make a bridges to the churches so that they can be more than just a Sunday morning church, but an everyday um, social political transformation type of, of instrument in the communities and neighborhoods that they serve. So very, very happy about that. Very proud to be a part of the program for its holistic yes. outreaches of ministry and programming. Yeah, so Dr. Adams, this is this is uh, Dr. Kowser. Can you hear me? Sure. Um, I want to affirm what Dr. Bridges said, and my hope is that in year three, that uh, the leadership teams of each Nehemiah church uh, in consultation with, with us put together a plan of outreach uh, that makes sense contextually for each church so that we know, for example, by talking to parents, mothers, fathers, 
grandmothers, grandfathers, uh, what is going on with our children? What is happening with our teens? Uh, how are people doing on their jobs? Do they have employment? So the whole person is, and, I'm, and when I say whole, I mean W-H-O-L-E for, for our purposes, is what's going on with my body, my mind, my spirit, what are the pressures on my family? What pressures am I facing in my job if I have one? What pressures am I facing as a woman, for example, with the changes that are coming around reproductive health and autonomy, how that is going to affect black women in some particular ways? What is happening with black men? Where are they? Um, that so that when a person, a new person approaches Lane Chapel, Simi Church in a year, a year and a half, they will come in knowing that Lane will attend to the whole person in very practical, meaningful ways that help that person or that family heal, grow. Am I making sense? Yes, yes, definitely, by all means. But what has happened is that these things can be to a certain extent found in other venues, to a certain extent. But those other places don't necessarily have Jesus and we do. And so what would it, what might it look like in year three as the buildings are being, money is being raised to refurbish and rebuild and build new buildings that also the churches are rethinking what it, are thinking about whole ministry, W-H-O-L-E ministry to the whole person and including uh, Sally Bard, in, including the whole person, which, it, it, which also means their sexuality. So it's the whole person and wrestling with that and all of that that it means so that I don't have to hide when I come into a church that I'm getting ready to lose my job and I don't know what I'm gonna do, that I can bring that to the body of Christ at Lane and it's gonna be dealt with in a way that's gonna help me survive and even thrive. That, that's what I'm talking about. So in chapter five of Nehemiah, you know, Nehemiah and his people are busy building the walls and all of that and they needed to do that. But in chapter five, the people rose up and said, y'all, we're selling our children into slavery because we are starving to death because we don't have any food because the price of food is too high. We don't have any grain to make bread because the price is too high. The payday lenders are driving us into the ground because of the loans and the amount of interest that we're paying on the loans. So they brought to Nehemiah their practical whole problem. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We need to, we have, I'm just envisioning a church where people can bring their practical whole problems and that the church is prepared to help with their practical whole problems uh, as an individual church, but as a collective of churches too. Does that make sense to you? Dr. Calza, do not forget the medical. Um, Absolutely, I've, yes, I've, sir. I've, I've got in health insurance, so I got three people in my church whom I'm ministering to in a very deep, deep, deep spiritual connecting type of way uh, that, that have forms of cancer, stage three, stage four, lung and breast. Um, not ashamed to admit that my mother was recently diagnosed with stage four breast and lung cancer and I'm ministering to her as well. So 
want to make sure that we include the medical and the, 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 the biological, the prescriptive medicines, health insurance, life insurance, so on. That's all a part of the holistic perspective, I believe, for the church to do really, really, really good theology. Yes, from, sir. from the local church perspective, you have to be, you must be, you must be committed to being inclusive to all of the ologies that yes. continue to yes. mess, yes. to mess, to yes. mess with our people. Yes, yes. Not just a few, but all of them. All, all everybody's in a mess. And uh, Reverend McElvaney, yes, on, yes, 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 on the mental health. So really, as we think tomorrow night about what, you know, as I meet with the lay uh, leaders, what what would it mean for each church in Nehemiah and perhaps even the collective churches in Nehemiah to be able to provide whole ministry, top to bottom, left to right, mental, physical, medical, legal, uh, children, education, what would that look like? And that, I suspect, that conversation, that vision, and then that practical piece of putting that into place will help heal us and heal our children so they come back. And so they're not going to stuff that is making them sick, to dope dealers that are making them sick to stuff online that's making them sick. But they come to our spaces, to our places, because they know they're going to get well and that the whole person's going to be attended to. Please, I'm going to stop talking right there. I just, that's, that's, where I'm, that's where I would take it if it were left up to me. That's where I would go. Here's a question for somebody to tackle how does the nehemiah project propose we reconcile the word of god with reaching the lbgtq community um uh, can it can it can i add something to that yes yeah i i think um first first off we have to see that the word of god is in reconciliation with all of mankind because second corinthians chapter five talks about we're to be ministers of reconciliation drawing people back to god so regardless of whether they're lgbtqa plus or whether they are um are normative heterosexual whatever term you wish to use that changes each year um <laughs> we have a responsibility to minister to everyone and I think it's like Dr. Kowser said, we're ministering to whole problems, to whole people with whole problems. And so uh, looking beyond simply the label of their sexuality, we have to um, see the problems that exist within humanity as a whole and who we are called to as people of faith with the answer to address those challenges for all of humanity. And so there is no us and them, there is no these or they. It is all of us and we're ministering to them to draw them to God. Regardless of whether I agree with your choice of lifestyle or not, it does not change the fact of my love and my passion for the truth for you and ministering to the whole of you, spiritual, physical, as well as social, as well as economic, all of that. That's just my little. Piece. I, I completely agree, and I and I, and I'm wondering if that if if ministering to the whole person without chopping off a leg or an arm or a finger, but the whole person, um, is in fact preaching the gospel. We have another question here. Uh, Reverend Baker asks, how can we, the Black church, take back the reproductive rights discussion such that pro-choice is not pro-abortion? Where is our voice in addressing this crisis? Let me say for most of us, 
pro-choice is not pro-abortion. Pro-choice just means it's the choice of a woman, her family, and her physician. As I once saw the other day that said, if it was really about the babies, we would do more to provide for healthy babies and the resources that they and their families need to thrive and survive. It's not even about health, it's about politics, it's about power and control over women, of which black women are collateral damage because they never have cared about us and our babies anyway. And often we've got to be careful about whose arguments that we make our own. Because when they're talking about things, they're not caring about us, they're not including us. We all know that no matter the age, most of our girls and women still carry those babies to term. And if they don't, it's still not our business or our concern. We don't know about a woman's health. We don't know about the dangers that may exist for her or for the child. And that's what most people are saying, including the Christian community. Yes, there are some that say that uh, life begins at conception, but who says that? And, 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 and there is no biblical support for that. Some arguments are not ours. We've got other concerns. Our churches are, we're trying to get our churches to thrive, trying to get our churches to survive. As we shared tonight, we want to minister to the whole person and the whole community. And that may include us also being part of the justice question as well. For the justice question asks, why are there homeless? Why do we not have a living wage? Why are our children always being subjected to substandard education. Those are the questions that even as the faith community, it is important for us to ask. Any other questions from either the panelists or from our audience? And, and Dr. McIntosh, I would, I would affirm that and to say that ministry to the whole person would include uh, creating an environment that is safe for persons to explore options, a range of options to, to in response to a range of circumstances that people find, everybody's in a circumstance. <laughs> At least in my world, everybody's in some, some kind of circumstance or situation. And the whole church, a whole church would welcome a full-throated discussion about a range of options for a range of situations that people find themselves in that makes sense for them. And the problem is that when we cut off range and options that are safe and legal, those safe and legal options become underground, illegal, dangerous, and deadly. And 
and so it, it gets to the, it really gets to the, back to the question of when we say whole person, do we really mean, who do we mean? What do we mean when we say whole, W-H-O-L-E? Uh, and if we cut off the finger or the arm, or I think Paul talks about that, that ain't the whole body. The body needs everything and can't function or struggles to function if we cut off arm, if we cut off options for people. The, yeah. and, and, and Dr. McIntosh is absolutely right that when we take away safe options for people. Um, we will have and will face um, profound and incalculable suffering. And when I say range, I mean exactly that, a range of options and the whole church would grow up into, into maturity such that all of those options would be open and a person could come and discuss them and not be shamed, shunned, or put out. That's right. And so this issue around whole W-H-O-L-E church to me is connected to the W-H-O-L-E gospel. Um, and for me, the scripture is the woman at the well, Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well. You know, we want to, a lot of folk want to focus on, you know, she got five husbands or whatever that is, but Jesus focused on her leadership. And if I'm reading it right, she went back to her community <laughs> and was the, mo the most significant evangelist quite, quite possibly in all of the New Testament. So he just didn't focus on where do you have five husbands, how many kids you got, and hey, who, who you, what's going on? No. <laughs> you, he saw her as the most significant evangelist, female, male, didn't matter, in the church at that time. In a community where he knew he wouldn't be welcomed himself. That's right. The Jews and Samaritans just didn't hang together. They didn't, and they still don't today. That's right. They still don't today. Other questions? We only got about three minutes, so we can uh -huh. take maybe one more question, a real short one. I'll say very quickly, Dr. McIntosh, Drs. Kowser and Taylor, I, I think it would behoove uh, the local church, the churches that are participating in this particular program, I think it would behoove us to begin again an intensive study of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, we have not talked much about the intricacies of this particular text, major or minor prophet considered, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired to go back to my church of appointment uh, to study the book of Nehemiah, not only for spiritual and biblical reasons, but also for programmatic connections to what we're trying to do here at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Uh, Dr. Adams, would you want that study to be uh, would you want that to be online? Would you want this? Is just, these are just some questions, just to think about. Would you want it to be online or some kind of way in person? 
would you want it to be um, led by us or do you want us to bring in our Hebrew scholars? When I say us, I mean organizers like Professor Taylor and I. Um, would, and when would you want it? No disrespect to your in-house scholars, the LPTS, the Greek and Hebrew personalities of your faculty, but I have full faith and confidence that with the people here within the Nehemiah Project, I'm sure that we can select and um, allow the, the preacher pontificators of the program teach it. Now, how and when and where, um, I'm assuming that's up to the directors and the administrators and the, and the high ups in the program. I, I'm just thinking theologically that we need to make sure that we have a good grasp of what the book of Nehemiah is about, the actions of Nehemiah, what that meant to the nation of Israel and what that means to the black local church uh, in Methodism in the 2022 context. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I see a show of hands or a, 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 a yes, a thumbs up, a thumbs down. If you could open up your cameras for this last 30 seconds. Uh, where are you on that? That thinking. I'm a thumbs up on that. Sounds like an excellent idea to me. Dr. Please Cal, tell Roland, yes. I think it's an excellent idea as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that uh, it maybe should be presented by someone who specializes in uh, that particular area. You mean in Hebrew, in the Hebrew uh, scripture? Yes. What if we, uh, we had both, we had a Hebrew scholar and we had organizers teaching it? Dr. Kowser. Would that work? So we, we, we really do both. We, we have the, yes, sir. Um, if you guys had listened intently to Dr. Taylor, he gave us a very good, um, even though it was brief, he gave us a very good synopsis of the book of Nehemiah and, and some of the goals and objectives of the book and the prophet and the prophetic action, prophetic ministry, so on and so forth. I'd be just as willing to listen to Dr. Taylor as I would any of the scholars there at LPTS. Mm -hmm. Let us take this, uh, because it is uh, 8.30 yeah. here in the East, let us take this to uh, back to the leadership team. Uh, two right. ideas that we I think we've heard tonight. One is holistic ministry, W-H-O-L-E and H-O-L-I-S, uh, going forward. A uh, second idea is uh, the Book of Nehemiah, a, a serious study of that uh, with Professor Taylor and, and also perhaps a Hebrew scholar. Uh, who can uh, really enrich uh, both for our purposes, but with uh, Professor Taylor in the lead on that. Did we, did we hear you, did we sum up correctly? And I also heard uh, our lay folks say uh, continued work with Dr. Bridges on youth and young adults and to present his research on youth and young adults and how to reach them, is that correct? Okay. Reverend All right, I'm turning we have run to over our time by two minutes, but we're good. Uh, we want to thank our Nehemiah Project leadership, our pastors. We wish to thank those who have tuned in, our lay leaders and others from the seminary and community who have joined to hear us share our first year experiences. We, we got one year down and in the middle of the second uh, and a couple of more to go following it. Does not yet appear what God has in store for us. Dr. Terrence Bridges will close us out with our prayer and then we will be free to have our evenings. Thank you again, everyone. Our God and our Father, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to be able to discuss and to talk 
and to reflect upon the great things that you have done. In the words of Pastor Linton, we know that it shall get better and better. It shall be the best because you have called it to be so. Father, we pray that you be with us as we leave this place tonight, that we leave God with words of inspiration that will bring transformation to our communities. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. We thank you. Amen.